Shabbat Shalom, Rastafari, and we're in the 36, the 36 um, weekly Senbet, Senbetawi, um, Sabbatical or Shabbatical reading and feeding from the Hebrew book of Numbers, known as the Midbar or pronounced in, in the modern way of Judaism as Ba. Ba Midbar, but really Be Midbar, Be Midbar or Midre Beda. So we're in the fourth, we're, we're in the third actually, the third um, reading from the fourth book, and this is the fourth book right here, the Hebrew book of Numbers. Now, let me just testify. You know, let me make a personal um, testimony that you know. For all my years of studying, you know, Torah and scriptures, the book of Numbers has some interesting things in it. But the real meaning of the book of Numbers, and, and this now comes to the very, very um, heart of the matter, was not really understood. Like, okay, Numbers, it's, it's called Numbers. But now as we're studying from the Amharic, from the Ethiopic, from His Majesty's Bible, and also now in our... Judaic, our Judaic building on our Judaic, our Ethiopian Hebraic foundation, which we could call Judah, the line of the tribe of Judah, what's called Judaism, it becomes very much more clearer. In fact, even this book is called from the Hebrew, Bemidbar. And what does Bemidbar mean? Or Bamidbar, Bemidre Beda, in the, in the Ethiopic the good is, it's known as Begedam, Gedam. Now, from a, a an Ethiopian Christian perspective, uh, the Gedam is like a monastery on a certain level. Yet, the word actually means wilderness. So, wilderness. So, what does wilderness mean? And, 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 and what about the wilderness? Why is the wilderness so important? Now, in this particular document right here, which is our compilation, let's get a little closer view of this. This is I and I compilation from some of the free resources that are online, right? This is a compilation right here. So you can go to it on the internet, you know, um, look up at Midbar, go to the Wikipedia if you, if you want to get that particular information right there. All right, so here we go. All right, so let's let's try to get this backlighting right here. All right, so that being that being that, so this is just to give you some of the reference sources. So numbers, numbers, as we touched on um, a couple of vids ago, numbers is dealing with accounting, how to count and to count. Now, there's a video that's out there. You can check it out on the YouTubes. Um, and we also have it for the educational, for the homeschooling, and for personal studies, you know, um, independent studies. So one can get a copy if they so desire or so need a copy. Go to the Doc Vids. And the video is called um, Secrets, right, in Plain Sight. Secrets in Plain Sight. And it's speaking on numbers. Let, let me just put it like that. Check out the vid for yourself. Now, it's interesting that in this present time I come across that vid and we just come into the book of numbers. And then as we're watching the vid, we begin to see the correspondence between the book of numbers. And, and this particular study right here is very, very important. It's crucial for the disciples. Um, these books right here, and this is the fourth one. The fifth one will be out soon, and soon the whole set would be there for the Torah study. So here, all right, this is the breastplate right here. This is what we're going to touch on on tribes. But since we began off like this, speaking on the wilderness, this is I and I, Beta, Israel, Rastafari, right? We want to speak on wilderness for a moment, and let's bring up this book right here. This is the PDF, right? Now, 
here you have a list of 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 the tribes, right? The, the list of the tribes, the order of the tribes. Now we're going to return to this in a moment, but let's first touch on wilderness. Since we began off on there, let's touch on wilderness. Because now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he has taught us and told us, and this is in our racket, that we're in the wilderness of North America. Mm -hmm. Now, here it says, well, this might not be the first quote, so let's go back a couple of pages so we can search this more correctly, all right? Um, let's start out right around here, and let us go forward right here. So it says, in the wilderness in the second month, Okay, so here, so we begin off here. Here's where we begin off, right? Begin from the heavens. This revelation is from the heavens, right? Look toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your offspring be, Genesis 15 and 5. As new emphasis that every nigga is a star, right? Uh-huh. But a lost star... An imploding star, supernova, what's going on? What's the what's the state? What's the status of the star? Is it in its is it, it, it is it in its proper order? This is what this book is speaking about, the proper order, the service and the ministry, as well as the foundation for both individual but more corpor corporate. You understand the corporate unity. All this stuff we hear about corporations nowadays actually is an outgrowth of the very law and wisdom that was given to our ancestors, the once lost, but now found data Israel. So on the wilderness, we have right here where it says, in the wilderness in the second month, this is how the book begins off. This is how the book of Numbers, the Hebrew book of Numbers, the Midbar, Torah portion, volume four, begins off. So the summary right here is that in the wilderness in the second month of the second year, Following the exodus from Egypt, God or Jah or Yah, if you please, Ha Elohim Baruch Hu, that he he directed Moses, Musa, to take the census of the Beit Israel men, age twenty years and up. Quote all those in Israel who are able to bear arms. Now, notice something right here about the age. You know, we speak about age appropriateness, and there's a lot of um, liars out there and blasphemers of Jah's word who try to make people believe that somehow the Bible is somehow archaic in the sense of it's, it's old, it's out of touch, it's not really dealing with issues of today. And so they're, they're testifying that they are not looking at the Bible as being relevant. So if we are to look at the Bible and find a relevancy, then we find out who is the problem, we find out what is the problem, and these individuals that have a, a false, a worldly, even a Gentile perspective to the Bible who say that it's not relevant, that they are the problem. Because right here, speaking about with the Israelites, of course, this was given to Beit Israel. Everything that we're reading here, especially in the Old Testament, is Beit Israel, and it concerns Beit Israel. Now, what, what what does that mean? That means that this was given to us. So we, of all people, well, if we ask for well, why are black people in the situation that they are in. You understand why they like the last hired, first fired, so forth and so on, because they've turned away from their wisdom. Now, in Africa today, we see that they have this whole situation about child soldiers, right? Well, we can tell that 3,000 to 4,000 years ago, that our ancestors, the Beit Israel, were very civilized, coming out of Egypt, an African, a black land that was a colony of ancient Ethiopia, they were very civilized in the sense that those who could serve and bear arms, we could talk about it today like carry guns, so to speak, were not those who were below the age of 20 years old, but who were above 
the, the, the age 20 years old or up, or 20 years old and up. So a census here was taken of them. This is just a, this is a passing point concerning um, um, age appropriateness, you understand? But just to show the relevancy of the Bible even today in many of these countries around the world, a lot of them will call themselves Christian, so-called New Testament, um, converted, you understand, proselytized ones by the Europeans who are taught just New Testament, New Testament. But if they read the Old Testament, they would have more true civilization, you understand, to themselves, even in their Gentile um, acceptance, speaking about a lot of these, you know, Africans, so forth and so on. But that's another point. Let's speak about who we are, because when we get our acts together, then going forward to the promised land, we have more to show and prove and offer. You understand? And this is why the wilderness is so very important, right? So let's go to right here. Now, here's a classic, um, what they call a classic rabbinic interpretation, right? A classic rabbinic interpretation of this particular matter. And, um, and we're dealing with chapter 1, right, in the book of Numbers. This is a review. Right, so that what comes after can be better understood and comprehended, as well as we can see what the practical apps, the practical applications of this are to us right now in 2012 and beyond. All right, so chapter one, Numbers chapter one, here it says that the, that the um, rabbis or the teachers, the Memharan, they discussed why Egziyavihir Lotu Subhat. Why the sustainer, Ha Elohim Baruchu, to him be the praises and blessed is he. He spoke to Moses, Moshe, in the wilderness. They, they, they had a discussion about this. Why did John speak to Moses in the wilderness? And we think in our own experience concerning the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Lemisale, for example, we see that we're here in the wilderness of North America. You understand? He also spoke to us in the wilderness, all right? Remember, the Bible says that before the Messiah, right, there would come Elijah. He would send, that God would send, right, the prophet Elijah to prepare the people. You understand? And now we can see this being manifested even in and through the works of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So this is how, this is one of the ways that it all connects. You understand? But the first thing we need to do is to get a, a groundation and a foundation on these matters. Let's just remind you of who we're you know, of who we're speaking of right here. So let's look up Elijah and see if we have um some a word a word picture to show and to and to demonstrate to you who Elijah was or who was our in that sense who was our Elijah, you know, it's interesting when you think about it, really, because if uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, on that level, if he was, and many of us see all the evidence that points to him being for us the once lost but now found, you understand, um, then who was Elisha, right? Then who was Elisha? And wasn't there another one, you know, there was, there was another one, was that the one who had the servant who had got leprosy and everything for taking the money, so forth and so on. And it was after the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you, you had Malcolm X, who seemed to be the one, but really he, he, he Malcolm X basically showed that he was unfaithful. You understand? He went backward and not forward. You know, a lot of folks don't like to hear that, but sadly, you understand, um, sadly that is true. So here's, here's our Elijah right here who spoke to us as well in the wilderness. You understand? Who was seeking to prepare a people. And whether ones like it or not or realize or not or recognize it or not, it was this Elijah that was sent to this lost sheep, to, to we lost sheeple and we lost black people. And people will talk about, you know, the situation of the, you know, he had got some 
um, young girls allegedly pregnant, and that was the reason why, you know, um, and, and these young girls were not underage. Let's, let's try to also make that very clear. You know, there's a lot of false rumors, so forth and so on, but we regard this to be the Elijah because he told us a couple of important things. You understand that the black man is God to say that the true humanity of Jesus Christ is black. Theologically speaking, the true humanity of Jesus Christ is black. You understand? And now, nationally speaking, that is, and biblically speaking, that is Ethiopian. Amos 9 and 7 says, Aren't you like the children of the what? The Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel. And it's this same man who was seeking to prepare people in spirit, you understand, in soul, psychologically, and also in body, cleaning up the filth and the mess that the double cross of um, reconstructionalism had made of the black people here in the Americas. This is a very great man. You understand? But what is it? A prophet, you know, um, is without honor among his own people and his lost sheep. And when we study this Torah portion here in the Midbar, where they're also in the wilderness, the Memheran of the Ihu, the Ihudim, or the Yehuda, or the Judahites, and even the, the converted Jews, they, they discuss why John spoke to Moses in the wilderness. Why the Midbar? Why the Gedam? Why the Midre Bedan? Why in the wilderness? Now, one named Raba, right, he taught that when the people open themselves, right, to everyone like a wilderness, God gives them the Torah. So when the people open themselves to everyone like a wilderness, right, um, that Jah at that time gives them Torah. And this is according to um, the Babylonian Talmud, Nedarim 55a. All right, but let's go forward a little bit. Similarly, a Midrash, one of the Yehuda Tenant or, or studies, it taught that those who do not throw themselves open to all, like a wilderness, cannot acquire wisdom and Torah. Now, that's very interesting. It's saying something to the people, to these people. Uh, and the opening up is that we have, we have closed ourselves off to our own people. I mean, I mean, overstand this whole psychology and this whole um, trauma-based mind control and coming back to those central words of trust and confidence, you know, um, that, that popular um, um, spell and witchcraft on the black mentality that always thinks the worst of black people. You understand? Or always goes to one extreme or the next. But here it's speaking about in the wilderness they had to open themselves up. You understand? In order to acquire wisdom and Torah. Now the sages, the sages, usually when they say the sages in Judaic or Jewish writing, they're talking about the the black Jews, in other words, the oldest of the Jews. Remember the Beit Israel of Ethiopia, their Judaism is conservatively estimated as being 2,600 years old. But really, it's really more like something like maybe 3,600 years old to, to, to almost 4,000 years old. But here the sages, they inferred from Numbers 1 and 1 that the Torah, uh, let us recognize what we are saying when we're speaking of Torah. So this Elijah right here is our Elijah, right, who spoke to us in this wilderness and was seeking to prepare a people. Now we have Malcolm X right here, but we'll close this off right now. That's another subject matter. We want to speak about Elijah, not one of his disciples. You understand? Um, um, Malcolm X being one of those um, disciples. Now, what do we have here? What we have here is, let's go to one, two, five, right? What we have here is uh, a trinity. Mm -hmm. 
what we have here is a trinity. Right now, what what what's the meaning of this trinity? Now, originally we want to touch on tribes, but we feel that it's very important to go into this book of Numbers and really to get a good grasp, getting a better grasp of numbers, right? Because Pythagoras says all is numbers. He he learned that in the wisdom schools of ancient Egypt, right? And this book is Numbers too, right? The book of Numbers, the Hebrew book of Numbers. But there's a very important um, message to the black man who has taken on his true birthright, right? Remember, the message to the black man was to wake up this lost and sleeping people as well as to counteract the the prophets of Balaam, of Balaamism. You understand, to wake the black people up who were in the wilderness concerning this spiritual Egypt. That was the role and the responsibility of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it's about time that we recognize that Elijah, who was sent to the black man of the Americas, instead of getting all caught up on all these other sort of political and so-called internal, so-called organizational issues, let's look at the big picture. Because we look at America, there's a lot of internal issues every day. You understand? But people always say the big picture of what the founding fathers, what was it their intention, what was their hopes and their, their dream or vision for us. So we have to do the same thing when speaking about our great black men and women, you understand, and even a few of the children, you understand, that were great as well, you understand, on that level, or what happened to them have greatly affected you understand, affected or even adversely affected, like Emmett Till, for example. You understand what I'm saying? So, Elijah, let's understand Elijah, let's understand the wilderness. And this is to add more emphasis to what do we mean, you understand, by the wilderness. What is truly meant by the wilderness and, 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 and bringing a, a, a synthesis Right, a synthesis to this particular discussion. Let's see if we have some more pictures. We can go to roots, you know, to show you the roots cover right there. You understand? Um, now, remember, Elijah Muhammad was very keen. He was very keen to remind us, right, um, uh, to avoid the so-called pale and red Arabs. Elijah Muhammad, uh, Elijah Muhammad was very pointed on that. And some of us are, are beginning and, and can see his, the, the wisdom of that. You know, Elijah Muhammad also said that the black man is not ready right now for Africa at, at, the, at that particular time. And he was very correct. He said the black man had to be cleaned up, had to get his act together. I want to open this picture right here to really show you that this is real when we're talking about our black people and Judaism. This is this is very real, although it might seem as though they have, you know, they have the so called tradition, you understand, of the European Jews. Some would say that's their tradition. But that might not be so if we really would study who we are and start to connect the half of the story that we have not been told. If I were to say that Elijah Muhammad was trying to get the black man in America from the state that he was and using, you understand, we could say the nation of Islam or those teachings that he attributed to Farad, Muhammad, so forth and so on, you know, that pointed that the black man is God, that there is a divinity to the black man's existence. Now, understand this theologically. Because everywhere divinity has been represented in its male or its female form in the Western culture, it has always been presented, you understand, in its whitewash form. You understand, and it, in its whitewash. Now, if you study in Christian history, the that iconoclast phase and stage where the pictures were whitewashed, you recognize the pictures were black before. So the ratio component to this has already been um, um, created by others, namely by the Europeans, 
You understand? It's been created, this whole racial dynamic. So when a man such as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is speaking about the divinity of the black man, which is similar to the Rastafari, ionized Rastafari, speaking about the divinity of his majesty, that is theological and that is biblical because Christ took on our humanity. He took on our flesh. This is gospel. You know what I'm saying? So that means he knows what it's like. Christ knows what it's like to be a black man. You know what I'm saying? He knows what it's like. He took on our humanity. He took on our flesh. So we are saying that just to try to further clarify this whole thing that, that, the, that, the, that the devils and, and, and the, the agents and the people who are plugged into the system who try to say that, oh, he was saying the black man is God and that's not true because there's no color and all that. That's not even biblical. Those kind of things they be talking. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was doing was speaking to the lost sheep, a lost people a lost people in the wilderness, and he warned this people. He, he warned us about the pale and the red Arabs. He warned us about the so-called pale and the red Arabs. He said, don't go over to them. But um, Malcolm X did not listen to that warning. Malcolm X went over there and said, oh, well, in my brief time over there, being that everybody know who I am and this is a whole international issue, so they're probably not going to treat me or show me the real deal. Because he obviously didn't see the real deal, what, 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 what um, uh, Malcolm X got to see when he went over to Mecca and even to Ethiopia. He did go to Ethiopia, but that's, that's, that's uh, one of the chapters of Alex Haley's autobiography, which he put in a safe deposit box and allegedly has never, ever be opened. And that concerns when... Um, um, Malcolm X, Malik al Haj al Shabazz went to Ethiopia. Now we know about that because of um, Rastafari and Ethiopians who were alive and saw Malcolm X in Ethiopia and were privy to the discussions that went on. And, and just a proof that Malcolm X went to Ethiopia, you understand, um, is the OAAU because the OAAU was based on the work of His Imperial Majesty Kedemawi Haile Selassie, who the Rastafari say is God and King of Kings, and who we in the society say he is our Godfather, Kedus, Abatach, and Abba, Kedus. Now, isn't that interesting, the whole God part right there, you know, and the connection with Elijah. Remember, Elijah, they say, was a man who, who, who had a, you know, just a basic elementary school education. Some say that he, he couldn't or didn't whatever read and write very well, allegedly. He, he was no scholar. But yet, many of the things he has said in how to eat to live, now we're on the holistic, organic phase. We can look at how to eat to live and see that it was right and exact. We can look at the message to the black man, you understand, as well as the prophecy that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spoke concerning these last days and time. Remember Peter? Remember Petros, Peter in the Bible? Remember how Peter, um, um, when, when he was there on the, on the mountain of the transfiguration, that he said, this is such a wonderful place, perhaps we should build like three, you know, perhaps we should build three altars. Remember that? Remember that that interesting statement by 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 Peter to build about three altars and everything, right? One for Elijah, right? One for um, Moses, and one for Christ, the Moshiach. And what did Jesus Christos? What did Jesus Christos? say to that. He said, get behind me, Satan, because you favor the things of the world. Now, th that's a key point, and that's a key part of scripture right there, if we would open up our eyes to see it. On the Mount of Transfiguration, where Christ was transfigured, right, and they said his garments was exceedingly white, they were exceedingly bright, right, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, um, what was said by Peter and how Christ rebuked what was said by Peter 
and said that you favor the things of the world. You understand? And, and he rebuked that. Now, that means that the world would take this and say, well, you're talking about the black Muslims, you're talking about the black Jews, and you're talking about black Christians. You are confusing it, my friend. You understand? Those are different religions. But not so, according to Yeshua HaMoshiach. Right, let's go right here. According to Yeshua ha HaMoshiach, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't three. Right, let's go right here to where he was um, trans, right, transfigured, right? Let's go to where he was transfigured. We have Matthew, right, 17 and 2, and we have Mark. 17 and um and and I mean you have Mark side 9 and 2. Which one we want to go to first? You going to go to 17 and 2. Let's go to 17 and 2. Okay, let's bring up 17 and 2. Now we have the um the the strong concordance opened right here. Let's just close the strong concordance so we can um read through this at a more at a more lively at a more lively pace. So let's go right here. Let's um, check that off. And so we're right here. So it begins 17, chapter 17. Because I want you to understand the connection. You see, the connection between the nation of Islam, mm -hmm, or rather the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, with the true Rastafari, you understand, based on our divine heritage, Judeo-Christian heritage, and, and to connect this, this, this mystic picture, you understand, because most of the people, remember what happened up here? Most of the people never saw what happened up here. You understand, most of the people, can remember, it says right here in Matthew 17 and 1, uh, it says, and after six days, Yeshua Taketh Petros, Petros, and Yaakov, and Johannes, his Wendem, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. So they were set apart. They were separated apart into a high mountain. So it was only these three that Yeshua took up, right, to the high mountain. Let's see if we bring up the Yota. Let's bring up the Yota right here. And now we're at this particular portion of the study, 17. Let's go to Yeh Mateos Wengel, Me'eraf Asara Sebat, Kuter And let's bring this up right here. Okay, you see this? All right. This is the Yota software. So Yeh Mateos Wengel, Wengel, Me'eraf Asara Sebat, Chapter 17, Kasidista Kenim. The Khala Yasusa Petrosina Yaikovin Wendemunim Yohannesin Yohannesin Yizo Nawada a regim terara be chacho win awet acho awet acho awet acho right and after six days Yeshua or Yesus taketh Peter James and John his brother and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Kuter uh, Kulet, verse 2, Befitachuwima Talawata, Fitum in the high Berra, Berra, Libsum in the Berhan Nechhone. Now remember, we're speaking about light here. Remember the Torah portion for this week, this week's Torah portion, the 36th. To our portion, Beha'a Lotika or Sitelequis. You understand? When you step up, when you light up. And here we have Yeshua now in Matthew chapter 17. It says, and was transfigured before them. Right? Was transfigured, was changed to Lewata. And his face did shine as the sun. Fitum in the Tahai Berra. And his face was shining like the sun. So now we have a verbal hieroglyphic here that we need to understand. We need the fitchi, you understand, the turgum on this, right? And his raiment was white 
as light. It was it was bright as light. It was it was clear. Lipsum in the Burhan Nech Hone Nech Hone. Right? And then it goes on to say in Kutar Kutar Sas or Shas that says in the home Musena Elias Kaarsu Ga Siya Negaru Tayu Acho. It says, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elias or Elijah. Elias right here is Elijah. Elias talking with him. So Yeshua now is on this mountain, right? This high mountain. This name what the mountain is, but it says a high mountain apart. Mm -hmm. Remember what happens at Sina, what happens at Sinai concerning the Torah concerning the law in, in these in, in, in these readings and feedings and the, the, the Torah portions that we're in right now in our Rastafari sabbatical studies. Now, keep that in mind. So now the context is here and it's clear and we have Christ now, the New Testament, the Hades Kidan, taking the veil from off our eyes so we can really understand the fullness or the fulfillment because Christ, Yeshua, the Moshiach, said that he did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it, to destroy the law. He didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. You understand, to give us the fulfillment of it. So there's a fullness of understanding. So we've been touching on the elementals, the basics of the Torah portion. So all disciples, Dekamez Amorit, those who are interested in the, in the discipleship here in this society of His Majesty, it's the Torah portion, the Torah readings, and hopefully we'll touch a little bit more on that. This is why we want to go through a review of, of, of numbers as we're going forward in the, the weekly portions, Torah portion readings, the Orit Minbab, is to get this clear. Let's, let's understand this clearly because it, 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 it has a, a relevance to our coming out, our, our, our experience in the wilderness to preparing to come out of this wilderness into our promised lands. You know what I'm saying? And therefore the repatriation needs to be understood by these key elements because His Majesty even says so in his autobiography, without me, that may they take note of the word that you have spoken without me, they can do nothing, John 15 and 5. This is in His Majesty's Mechadim, the autobiography, book 1. You can read it in his prayer to the Son, in his prayer to Yeshua HaMoshiach, Yesus Christos, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now let's understand that connection there. If we keep his words, then the Father and the Son, he sups with us individually. You understand? Know individually and then corporately, collectively. So this is why we have to get our individual houses, our heads and hearts in order. So this message for each of us individually. Let's understand that. But now, let's understand that Moses and Elijah was talking now with Yeshua. Now, in Kutar Arat, it says, Pet Rosim Mel Sol Yesusin, then answered Peter and said to Yeshua, Gietahoi, Gietahoi, Adonai, Adonai, Bamarinya Namhai Gieta, Gietahoi, O Master or Lord. Bezi mehon lenya melkam no. A bit of this. Bezi sostas andunalante andunem le muse andunem le eliasa inisra inisra ale. It says, he, 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 now hear what, 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 what Petro said, what Peter said. Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. This is a great spot we're at right now. This point right here is it's good for us to be here, right? But remember that, that to be here, you understand, is to be taken in almost like, let's just stop here. You understand? You know, they, something was revealed to them. But let's understand how what Peter did, we also sometimes or might have done or might be doing what Peter did as we're going about our study and reading and feeding, right? It says, if thou wilt, like if you will, Lord, let us, allow us, uh, right, let us make here three tabernacles. Let us make here sauce das, three tabernacles. Now, let's understand what, Pet uh, what Petros is saying, what Kiefa is saying. He said, let us make three tabernacles, Remember, we're talking about the one tabernacle. 
He's saying, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias, or e e e Elijah. Now, why does this have relevance with where we're at and what we're studying? Well, let's, let's look at what happens next in this. Kutir um, Amis, Arsum, Arsum Gena Sinagar, in the home, Baruch Demena Gardacho, in the home, Kademenao, Arsu Desa Yemilen Yemawado Lije Yehino, Arsuna Sumut Yemil Dent Meta, while he yet spake. Notice, notice that while while the words were still in Petrosis' mouth, while the words were still in the Afu, you understand? You know, while the words were still in his mouth, it says, Arsum Gena, Gena Sinagar, like, like still while he was speaking, and Neho, behold, look, something, was hap something happened right then while he was speaking. A bright cloud. A bright cloud. Remember that the Beta Israel, the Israelites, they were guided. Overstand this: that they were guided, right? They were guided by a cloud, right? A cloud by was it by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? That's how they were were, were guided. Now there's a connection with that in the wilderness. I want you to understand because when they say it took them to a high mountain apart, the implication is. That took him to the, what? The wilderness. So it says, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, and look, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. This is the, the Bain Ha Elohim, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This is interesting that, that this voice that came out of the cloud, whose, whose voice do you think this voice was to imply whose voice? You understand which, which person in that sense of the Trinity, of the Seleus Caduceus, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Well, obviously it's the Father. So the Father now was saying to the disciples, I want you to understand this, my Rastafari brothers and sisters, the Father was saying to the to the um, to the disciples, to those disciples who were privy to this, hear what Jesus Christos is saying, and this too is the testimony of His Majesty to us. The testimony of His Imperial Majesty to us is one and the same. To hear what. Jesus Christos is saying to us, and we see that very clearly in the in the autobiography. So we have this aspect and this element as well. All right. So a voice came out the cloud, right? A voice came out the cloud, said to the Peter mainly. You know what I mean? Let's go back to the text for a moment. Let's look at something in the text. Let's look at what well, it's saying to all of them. It spoke to all of them. You understand? It didn't personalize it, the response to Peter, because others probably felt the same way that Peter felt, but Peter was being Peter, and he spoke. You know what I mean? Peter was like that kind of brother or sister. We have our Peter aspect in us. So when we're talking about, well, how are the tribes counted? And we're saying the counting or the numbering is dealing with the counting and the accountability. So we have to understand the accountability both subjectively you understand as well as objectively vis-a-vis -vis this particular book because it says that one who has wisdom, let him do what? Let him count. Let him be accountable. And if he's accountable, you understand, he'll recognize that number of the beast, which is the number of a man, which is, which is a certain state in man that does not go beyond a certain level. You have to get stuck on a particular level. And when we look in John chapter 6, verse 66, and what's connected with that, that will give us a powerful indication. You know what I'm saying? It's not understanding. It's not submitting to Christ's word, even though you've begun discipleship, even though you've begun to follow Christ, and this happens to many, many ones. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like a late term in the sense abortion. You understand? One's 
us this have been born again, something aborts that process uh, of rebirth. You understand? In other words, they go away from that. They're not hearing the voice. They're not accepting that voice, the testimony of Yeshua. You understand? So that voice came out, right? That voice came out, you know. That voice came out and said, hear his voice. And it says, when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And this sounds much like what happened with in the wilderness with the uh, Beta Israel when they heard the voice too. What happened with them? And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. Um, verse 7, And Yesus Karbo Adasesachona, and Yeshua, he came and he touched them. He touched them. He laid hands on them, right? And said, Arise, be not afraid. Tenesu. In other words, raise up, resurrect. Tenesu. Atifuru. Alacho. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man saving Jesus only, saving Yeshua only. Ainachuanema akintom siyayu. And when they lifted up their eyes, they didn't see anyone, only Yeshua. Now, um, from cement to Zetain, Yayachuhutin Lemanimatinagaru below Azizacho. So now he commanded them, and when they came down from the mountain, Yeshua charged them, saying, Tell the vision. And saying, Tell the vision, uh, or, or, or really, tell the vision, tell the vision, tell the vision to no man. In other words, don't tell what you have seen to anybody until the Son of Man. Right, be risen again from the dead. Now it says, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes, all those who have written, you understand, all the scholars, that are scribes, those who have studied these things in great detail, just like others who have studied it in great detail, and we have the sabbatical readings and feedings as we publish right here, and um, the midbar, let's bring that back right here where we were. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, we're on page, um, I think this is what, page 30? Mm -hmm. Let's touch on this right here, the scribes. So now, there's a very interesting point right here which is being made about the scribes, right? About the scribes right here, right? The scribes are like the sages. You see where it says sages right here? These sages are very much like the scribes, the sages right here, right? The sages, they inferred from Numbers 1 and 1 that the Torah, the Orit, was given to the accompaniment of fire, water, and wilderness. This is key. Fire, water, and wilderness. That when the, when the Orit, when Torah, right? When, when this Torah, the five books of Moses, the foundation, the law, that we study the law that the New Testament says is a schoolmaster. We know that the, the, the law, the commandment contained in ordinances, you understand? Um, we know that that has been done away with in Yeshua HaMoshiach, so we don't have to sacrifice an animal, so no animal cruelty, in other words. That's what that means in a practical app, a practical application. Because Christ's sacrifice has done away with that vain sacrifices of, 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 of animals. You understand that, that killing of animals. So there is a very um, Peter-like Peter, understand the Peter and the Peter. So it's this sacrifice, right, that has done away with any animal, the animal types of sacrifice. So... The sages, which are the scribes, they tell us many things. And this is why it's important to study this. You understand? And these Torah books and that we're publishing now, we, we're even finding them to even be more um, 
um, practical and and applicable to our inner life. You know what goes on in in our spirit, in our soul. You know, within you know, and our peace with Jah, our peace with God in Christ, you, and also our also peace with our fellow man, and our long suffering and the wisdom that allows us as the Almighty wills to touch ones who are able to receive it. If they're not able to receive it, so be it. You know what I'm saying? But the Torah was given to the accompaniment of fire, water, and wilderness, and the giving of the Torah was marked by these three features to show that as these are free to all people, so are the words of Torah. You see, as these are free to all people, the word of Torah, Torah, the word of the true and living God, is also free to all, whether Jew or Gentile. Now, understand that and understand what Hawaria, um, the Apostle Paul said, uh, Paulos, what he said about, not just for Jew, or, but for, for Jew and for Gentile, for Jew and for Gentile. You know, it's interesting what, um, what, um, um, Paul says in many ways concerning the, the Hebraic faith. Some Gentiles will make you think, you understand, that that Old Testament Torah law has nothing to do with it. You understand? And that the, that the, that the ten words, the Decalogue, you understand, has been somehow done away with. And this is probably one of the reasons why, because of that false preaching and the false gospel. Instead of the true message that speaks of um, the love of God and, 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 and the morality and righteousness and, and, and calls what, what is good, good, and what is evil, evil, what is against God's or contrary to God's law. We don't see that in the so-called church world so much today. You understand? Many people think that um, the Old Testament, you understand, has nothing to do with it. What Christ did, he fulfilled it. He didn't do away with it. He perfected it. You know, since the ones are without any sort of an excuse. So the giving of the Torah was marked by these three features, fire, water, and wilderness. Fire, water, and wilderness, right? Through the fire and through the water. Now, if you look at our experiences here in the wilderness of North America, we clearly see the fire, even the burning of the crosses. We clearly see the water, the drownings, um, Katrina, you know, even Emmett Till's body was found. They would throw it in a swamp. And the wilderness, this whole experience here in the wilderness. But there's the giving of the law, the giving of the Torah, being marked by these three features to show that it is free to all people. That's what we find all people referring to the struggles of black people in America, whether civil rights or they usually try to limit it to that as inspiring the, the many different movements that have been exp inspired by black civil rights, by, by this law of sheep, so are the words of the Torah. As Isaiah 55 and 1 states, everyone who thirsts, everyone who is thirsty, to the temacho, you understand, nu, you understand, lewuha, in other words, come for water. They can come for the water. Anyone who thirsts, who hungers and thirsts, for truth and for righteousness needs to study, needs to read, needs to hear the word of the word of God and the teaching of His Majesty and the testimony of His Christ. Now it goes on to say, and this I thought was a very interesting point down here, that there's another study or midrash, another Judaic study, which taught that if the Torah had been given to the Israelites in the land or the Eretz, it's the Eretz. It's Arael or Yish Arael, right? That the tribe in whose territory it was given would have said that it had a prior claim to the Torah. So if it was given when they got in the land, then one tribe would say, well, it was given to us. And this is now very important for us to understand because um, as the Lord's sheep, as Beta Is Arael, there are 12 tribes. And we want to discuss what these 12 tribes actually mean or what's the application What's the numbering, the accounting? How, do, how can we account for this? You understand? Based on the word of Jah, based on the applicable applications of this. And there's two very interesting examples. One is the black Hebrew Israelites, 
accounting of the 12 tribes. And the next is the 12 tribes of Israel organization, a Rastafari organization, which, which um, came about as an Ethiopian World Federation local back, I think, in the 70s. You understand late 60s and, and, and during the time of the 70s, right? And they also have repatriated and have, 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 have a foundation, what's called a Jamaican Sefer, within Shashamani, within Ethiopia. You understand? But now, why is their um, efforts able to be successful? Many of the other Rastafari, and we as Rastafari need to take note of some of the key, the key elements. Organizationally, they began off as a local of the Federation. This is why we have adopted the bylaws for our church of cooperations here in the Society of His Imperial Majesty, we call them the UCC, the Universal Church or the Churchical Code. You understand? Because there needs to be a certain order of of business. You understand? A, a certain a certain protocol. You understand? Um, a certain modernization of, of the government. You understand? Of Ethiopian Hebrew affairs. You understand? So the Constitution of the Ethiopian World Federation and its and its and its history, tracing it to the very earliest and beginnings. That provides us a a very good foundation. You understand a, a cornerstone, a foundation. Now, as far as the activities of the federation, um, we are still members and and we still have are able to localize our operations. But because of the lack of transparency, you understand, the lack of regulation, you understand, a lot of irregularities, you understand, these and those who claim to be, um, you know, who claim to be the elected, so forth and so on, it does not represent the consensus of we, the black people, and we do not um, recognize that it protects the integrity of our divine heritage nor the dissemination of our Ethiopian culture among the members and amongst our people. You understand? So we're going to the first, you know, the cornerstone, which is churchical, because it's the, the true um, Ethiopian, Hebrew, African-American black churches that were able to coordinate and work along with our holy and righteous Ethiopians like Dr. Malako Emanuel Bayan to establish the Federation from the very beginning. Now, others have crept in unawares, you understand, know and there's some who actually mean well within different uh, Ethiopian World Federation activities, but due to that lack of transparency and that lack of um, regulation and many of our warnings that we had given to various parties claiming to be Federation, we withdraw and we maintain our letters of authorization, you understand, and the society must be built, you understand. I mean, this is the real cornerstone. These teachings right here actually are our divine heritage. This is our divine heritage, and many ones and ones who claim to be Federation are not really teaching the divine heritage of who we are or how to get our houses in order, you understand, or the true... Um, the true spirituality, the true theocracy, you understand? And in this we learn about even monarchy, the true foundations of reestablishing and restoring the monarchy because of these Torah scroll teachings and Rastafari sabbatical studies. You understand? This is the cornerstone of it. This is the preamble. We're focusing on the preamble and Article 1. You understand? We're focusing on that in real time. So just to clarify that, because there are certain questions about federation activities and what are our activities and our members and our friends and brothers and sisters who we are working with, that is, that's where we're at right there with that. You understand? So um, with that being said, let's go on. That So this was not given in the land of, of, of Israel. Like, like this was not given in Ethiopia, but given to us in diaspora, in other words. Because if it was given in the land of Israel, like if this was given in Ethiopia, if the authority for even the land grant was given in Ethiopia, then the tribe in whose territory it would, was given would have said that it had a prior claim to the Torah, you understand, to that land grant. 
You know what I'm saying? To to Shashimani even. So John instead he gave it here in the wilderness of North America. So so see that's a very important connection right there that this was given to us here in the wilderness so that all should have an equal claim to it. So regarding Ethiopian World Federation, every twenty five black people or black persons who recognize themselves as Ethiopian Hebrews, you know what I'm saying? They have an equal claim to Ethiopian World Federation. So the the the, 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 the bigger picture of the Federation, you know what I'm saying, will be fulfilled. You know what I'm saying? A lot of folks are rushing and, and doing a lot of a lot of unauthorized activities in that particular name and they have kind of exiled us. You know what I'm saying? We've been so called exiled. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't want a rebuker. They don't want one who is who is telling them you have to study. You know what I'm saying? You have to pray. There's real hard work that you know, that has to go on. You know what I'm saying? There's there's real repentance. They don't want to hear that message. You know what I'm saying? So allow them to do this is similar to the Korah part. The sons of Korah is similar to that particular incident, Korah and, and Moses. But let's go on a little bit more because we've hit about the hour mark. And we could come around and do the next part to this right here. But so you understand this this link. This is page thirty, and this is under this is under. If you want to search out on the internet, go to the Wikipedia and uh, look up our uh, midbar, B A M I D B A R, and look up the Parsha portion, and you can read up on this right there. So another midrash had taught that as the people neither sow nor till in the wilderness. Understand that. We don't sow or till in the wilderness, but we got these counterfeit prosperity so-called pimps and preachers speaking about tithes and taking Old Testament into a New Testament sense, but saying that the law doesn't apply for sacrifices or anything else, but almost making this like a sacrifice. You see, you got to check out that vid, that exposed vid, and there's a lot of other ones out there, even from the church itself that are pointing this out because most of these folks claim to be Gentiles, but they go into the Old Testament, right, and then say that ones have to give a tithe, even though the tithe originally was not monetary. It was of the grain, you understand? It was of, 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 of the income, the blessings of the land. But here in the wilderness, remember we're in the wilderness of North America, the people do not sow, nor do they till. So those who accept the yoke... Now, this is the yoke. Remember the yoke, the word yoke, and how it links with discipleship? This is the yoke of Torah. This is the real yoke of Rastafari discipleship, and those who accept this, right, just like those who accept the yoke of Torah within Judaism are relieved. They're relieved by the community of the yoke of earning a living. Now, this is a very interesting situation. This is a very interesting thing right here. Now, some would say, oh, this is just giving one an excuse, you know what I'm saying, to, to just read Bible and not do no real work. No, it's not. Not when you put, put it in its proper order. We're not just taking this out of context. We're going to continue with this particular study, but this is what's very, very interesting. This is why among the other Jews, you understand, the European and the converted Jews, they have understood this from their study of Torah and from a lot of our ancestors' ancient writings. You understand, from the first century, the, the, the first couple of centuries of Christianity, you understand, there was still the, the, the presence, the overt presence of the Ethiopian or black Jews. You understand, the original ethnic Hebrews. But historically speaking, a lot of events happened that flipped the script, you understand, on the black Hebrews and Israelites and Ethiopian Hebrews. And that's a part of the historical record right there that some of the brothers and sisters and others have done videos and lectures on that particular aspect, all right? Um, and the wilderness does not yield any taxes from, from crops, you see, so the way that a lot of the pastors and preachers have it, claiming to be Gentiles, is really contrary to law. It's what the scriptures say that, um, and through mischief, you understand, through, through mischief of the law, and through mischief, you know, taking the law mischievously. So the wilderness does not yield any taxes from crops. So scholars are free in this world. Scholars, this is why the Gedam, 
It's why you have the saints going to the wilderness. Even Ethiopia was, for early Christianity, likened to be a wilderness where ones went into that particular wilderness. You understand? Let's bring this up right here, into that particular wilderness. So what do we have here? Right? And, and, and we keep Elijah right there because Elijah, in this wilderness, he has given a powerful testimony that many did not fully understand. Many of us didn't even fully uh, understand or fully comprehend it. But now, in these latter days, as he says in his word, we are better willing and able, you understand, to overstand this and to comprehend this. So um, stay tuned. This is the Elijah reasoning, the wilderness. The wilderness is still a study that you should go into a little bit more detail. And this is why we, um, once again, let's see if we can get that, bring that um, cover of the book up. Um, let's see what windows we, what windows we have open. Um, let's see, where's the window? So you can see the cover. Here we go, the midbar. Right, the midbar. Where's that window? Ben Midbar, let's see if we can, oh, it's down here, all right, this particular book right here will, will help and clarify, so Elijah, he has brought us that testimony of who we are, you understand, and how we're in the wilderness of North America, but there's important lessons for us, what have we learned, you understand, in this wilderness, I mean, Elijah Muhammad's writings as well are very important for those who are able to to um, study it. So it's the midbar is where we're at and we're reviewing, you understand, the, the first couple of Torah portions. We're going through a review of it, especially since we see that there's a lot of applicable, there's a lot of apps, you understand, there's certain applications of this word vis-a-vis -vis, um, repatriation, vis-a-vis um, the forward to Africa movement. We said before, the ancestors said back to Africa, but we say forward ever, backward never. The forward to Africa, you understand, in the whole forward to Africa movement. The book of Midbar, the Midbar, or the Hebrew book of Numbers, is a very important study. And we're going to continue on um, Torah study. Why is um, Torah study um, relevant? to us. So stay tuned for the next part of this, all right? Shalom, Rastafari, more to come. Stay tuned. Pray and work.